How do billboards talk? Anyone? Sign language. <laughs> I know, right? It's awesome. You could uh, almost kind of anticipate the groan, but that's not bad. So, hey, let's flip, uh, flip in your Bibles to, you can open up to uh, Exodus chapter 3. Um, the ushers, I think, have notes if you didn't get these on the way in. We're continuing our series um, for conversations with God. And this series, you know, obviously we've been doing, I think, since January. So it's been going on for a little while. And I really like it because um, it gives me some hope for my own conversations with God. It gives me some context and also helps me, um, like we did Jacob, you know, we talked about what kind of conversation with, do you have with God when you're at a fork in the road? Um, and that was super helpful. I don't know about you, but I got a boatload out of that. And uh, the last two weeks when I did Moses, the beginning first part of Moses, um, it really made an impact on me when I started looking at that conversation between God and Moses uh, when God showed up at the burning bush. And that back and forth between God and Moses at the burning bush really was, a, was very powerful to me because I think sometimes we think a conversation with God has to be kind of clean and, and sterile and clean, you know, kind of uh, humble and, you know, just this non, non-conversational, non like eye to eye and, and real honest and vulnerable. But Moses' conversation with God, and we've seen all along, these conversations have some real good application for us. And so looking at Moses today, we're going to be looking at chapters 3 through chapter 6, sorry, chapter 7, verse 5, because this is the, the conversation with God as a continuation of what we did last time. But I found it as I was studying this, I noticed in, Gen, in uh, Exodus 3, chapters 3 and 4, God and Moses go back and forth. It starts at the burning bush, but they go back and forth. And if you're here last time... Um, they went back and forth 12 times. God speaks to Moses, Moses comes back to God. Then God speaks to Moses, and they do this back and forth. So this is, I think, one of the most extensive conversations, conversations. You get Abraham when he, when he was um, interceding for Sodom and Gomorrah. That's, that was quite a bit. But this, I think, is even more. And then as I started looking at this, it, it's this back and forth thing that goes from chapters 3 and 4. But that's not the end of it. And most of the time when we think about, and this is me, I'm, I'm just being really honest with you. When I think about Moses, I go from this, this burning bush thing, there's a little bit of white noise in the middle, and then I jump over to the plagues. Anybody else feel like that? It's probably just me. But this little white noise section for me was really powerful to look at because this conversation with God that Moses has, and you can see on your notes here, that very beginning part, that initial conversation this is what Moses says back to God. God shows up and says, hey, I'm going to use you to deliver Israel from uh, slavery and bondage with Egypt. And the very first thing Moses says to God, well, who am I? Makes sense. <laughs> who am I? I'm an 80-year-old guy on the backside of the desert for the last 40 years. I know prior to that I had some bad history in Egypt, but who am I? Who am I and who am I? Both ways, both ways. And God, <laughs> I appreciate God doesn't even answer that. <laughs> he just blows it off and like keeps going. And I think sometimes we have to get over ourselves, right? And we're not, it would not be an obstacle. But as you keep going through this, you can see, then Moses is like, okay, well, if you're not going to answer that, then who do I say that you are? <laughs> so not only who am I, but who are you? Because if I'm going to go and talk to the Israelites and tell them, hey, God told me, they're going to say like, well, who's God? Because we, if we're down here in Egypt, we've got a boatload of gods down here. Who are you talking about? So who are you? And God does answer that. Tell them I am that I am. And then he keeps going. He's like, what if they don't believe me? I love these, these questions that Moses asks God because they're very similar to what we would say. How many of you would say the same thing? God shows up on your doorstep. And appreciate that when God shows up on, on Moses' burning bush step, <laughs> He tells them to do something impossible. Has God ever told you to do something impossible? This is what Pastor Aaron just talked about. This is about saying yes to God and pushing forward. And let me just say to you that, and this is part of our takeaways, I believe that what God asks you to do is always impossible. 
and will require God's help. God doesn't give you an assignment for you to be independent, isolated, go off on your own little thing. God gives you impossible because God wants to participate in your life to accomplish that. So he shows up at the burning bush doorstep and says, hey, here's, some, here's an impossible assignment, mission impossible. <laughs> Moses, love his reply because it's very similar to what we do. Who am I? Can't do that. Who are you? Well, I don't know what I'm going to tell them. And then what if, what if they don't believe me? They're going to think I lost my, 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 my I'm crazy. I'm off, off my rocker. I'm a total lunatic. And then the next thing Moses says is, I'm inadequate. I don't have the skill set. I, you know, I don't, I don't want to, I, I don't have the, the vocabulary for this. I'm not, you know, speech is a problem for me. I stumble, I stutter, da, 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 lack confidence, all this stuff. Anybody ever do that with God? I'm inadequate, I'm deficient. You know, there's other people that are highly qualified. Look at them, and not me. It's time to stop saying not me, right? And then he says this, <laughs> send someone else. <laughs> Pick Jerry. Jerry McClear is the perfect poster child to do the impossible, right? Wave at us, Jerry. We know it. We know it. Jerry's the one right there. Mackenzie, she just graduated from college. Oh, my gosh, she just called on me. But it's true. We think it's pick somebody else. Pick, pick Denton. Oh, my gosh, he's got an amazing softball bat. He can hit home runs like there's no tomorrow. My softball team is here tonight. Thank you, Jesus. So much fun. Give it up. woo -hoo! All the chicks. Yeah, baby. Okay, so send somebody else. Send somebody else. I like this back and forth. And I like that God doesn't, God finally at the end of it gets exasperated with Moses. Oh my gosh, enough already. I'm going to give you Aaron. And so this is kind of that initial conversation. But I want you to appreciate that when we have those initial conversations with God, and they're, they're very life-changing conversations, but it's not just enough to have the conversation. The conversation with God needs to come into our real life. It's one thing to have the conversation, the mountaintop experience. Later on, we'll see Sinai. Not tonight, but later. And it's one thing to have those. But it's, an, it's a different experience to say, okay, I'm going to take the conversation and everything God said, all the dialogue back and forth, all this stuff, and I'm going to bring it into my daily living. Now, what does that look like? And that's what I want you to see here. Because God's conversations with Moses start to go into his daily living. The very first thing Moses does is he goes and he talks to his father-in-law, Jethro. I know you think Jethro Bodine. Come and tell me about a story about a man named Jed. Jethro Bodine. What was that? Beverly Hillbillies. Just telling you. Little rabbit trail. So he goes to Jethro, and he says, Hey, I feel like God's put in my heart to go back to Israel, or go back to Egypt and liberate. And Jethro's like, Thumbs up, dude. Go at it. Okay. And that's what God's conversations do. When we start to walk and step into those conversations in our daily living, you can appreciate that there's going to be some confirmation. Now, don't hear me right, because not everything's going to be, <laughs> you know, no clouds and, and perfect thornless roses. It doesn't play out that way entirely. However, you do get some of those initial, you get some confirmations, incremental confirmation, that's what I call it. The second thing that happens is that not only does Th Jethro say thumbs up, but as Moses is walking around, Aaron, his brother, this is his older brother, meets him. And there's a good meeting together. And God told Moses back in that initial conversation, I'm going to give you Aaron. Aaron's going to be your spokesperson. He'll be your mouthpiece. You're going to tell him, and then he'll tell everybody. So Aaron's coming to meet you. And sure enough, Aaron shows up in that moment. Oh, my goodness, here he is. Wow, what happened? And the question in my mind is, where was Aaron before? Was he back in Egypt? You know, did he know what, that his little brother killed somebody? You know, there's all these, like, little peripheral questions. But Aaron shows up. So Jethro gives him a thumbs up. Aaron shows up as a spokesperson. And then finally, God gives, um, God gives Moses those, those um, signs and wonders. So put your hand in your coat, bring it out, it's leprous. Put it back in your coat, take it out. The leprosy's gone. Take your rod, throw it on the ground, shepherd's rod, and it turns into a snake. It freaks him out. 
totally freak him out. So he's like, that's okay, pick it up by the tail. He picks it up by the tail, turns back into a rod. So he's got these demonstrations, signs and wonders, miraculous things. And, it, and Moses takes those, takes Aaron, takes those signs and wonders, and I appreciate what Moses does. This is that conversation with God, and he brings it into his daily life. And he says, okay, well, if you've told me to do this stuff, you've brought Aaron, you've given me the confirmation with Jethro, then we'll take this stuff and we'll bring it to the leaders of the Israelites, and we'll demonstrate to them. Because here's what you see here, and I like this, because when... Moses does those signs and wonders to the Israelites. The Israelites say, okay, we're on board with you. We think it's okay. We agree with what, what God, God has spoken to you. And I want you to appreciate that your conversations with God, they tell, God tells you things that are impossible. But as you begin to start incrementally and appreciate, it's this incremental, a little bit at a time. A lot of times we want the Grand Slam home run where we see the full picture and it's this monstrous demonstration. But more often than not, God's conversations with us start to get into our daily living in pieces and parts a little bit at a time. Line upon line, precept upon precept. So it's a little bit with Jethro. It's a little bit with Aaron. It's a little bit when he does a demonstration with, with the Israelites. Then the Israelites say, okay, we believe you. We're going to follow you. But here's where it hits the fan. <laughs> because in Exodus 5, verses 1 through 21, you have this, this and you've got to maybe put yourself in Moses' sandals. This has got to be pretty encouraging stuff. Up to this point. I mean, this big conversation with God. And then he starts making these incremental steps. It's progress. It's progress with Jethro. It's progress with Aaron. It's progress with the Israelites. So... If, if you're like me, I would be like, sweet, this is going to be just one series of green lights. It's going to be smooth sailing, right? Easy breezy. We got one, two, three, and then we'll just march into Pharaoh's little palace and say, dude, we're out of here. That's how, this, how it's going to roll. But we all know that's not how it rolled, right? So it hits the fan because Moses gets Jethro, Aaron, they all come. They do, and they do the demonstration step before Pharaoh. Watch this. This is a cool sign of wonder. Boom. And then Pharaoh's magicians do the same stuff, right? Leprosy, not this rod, then the snake, all that stuff. And, uh, you know, that's got to be kind of like off, off-putting to Moses. <clears throat> what gives? And then, and then it makes it worse because Pharaoh says, Y'all must be, have too much time on your hands to do all this lazy, conjuring, dreaming stuff. You're never going to get out of here. So we're going to make everything worse for all the Israelites. We're going to make them gather up their own straw. In the past, we provided straw for them. No more of that. You've got too much time. And, and, and you, the, if you want to do this, then we'll just make you so busy. We'll demand so much from you. You don't have any time to do any of that foolishness. And so he puts this heavy, heavy. And it seems to backfire. How many of you appreciate that? And I think these conversations with God, a lot of times that happens. If you've been around Jesus much, done much of the Bible stuff, in your own life you see this a lot of times. You'll have this conversation with God. You'll get pumped up. You'll get stirred up, really excited. Start to make these steps, and you see some good things happen. You have some uh, positive confirmation and some things that, that line up. And then how many of you ever hit the wall? And you're like, whoa! What was that about? I didn't think it was supposed to roll out that way. And I, I'll never forget. That's what I thought. <laughs> Reese talked about it Sunday morning when, when he, we first got married. And I felt called into the ministry. And then he comes home and listens to that guy on the answering machine. And he didn't tell you this, but he's like, you're going to call that man. I'm going to stand here and listen to you tell him that you're not coming to his church. And I'm about ready to cry. You know, I'm embarrassed and all this stuff. And so... But I think, you know, it hit the fan. What the heck's going on here? And so a lot of times we have that experience. And that's what happened with Moses. He's like, we were on a good roll here until we hit Pharaoh's palace. And then it all just obliterated. Now what? So in those moments, if you're like me, I want to pack up my toys and go home and play by myself. I'm done with this little roller coaster. Out. Peace, baby. I'm done. But I like what happens here. Because with, with Moses, and you can see here, 
he looks at the obstacles and he goes back and does these conversations with God. He continues this conversation from the burning bush. He carries it through this day-to-day -day stuff. But then there's more conversation that happens. Because if you look in chapter 5, verse 21, after Pharaoh said, no more of this stuff, you gather your own, your own uh, straw, Moses and, and God have a conversation back again. Chapter 5, verse 22 through chapter 6, verse 8. And Moses says to God, dude, this is not how it's supposed to go. You said liberate. I walked in and he made it even worse. He made the bondage even tighter. He tightened the screws and made this whole slavery thing significantly worse. This is not how it's supposed to roll. And God speaks back to him and says, it's going to be fine. Don't worry about it. I've got something in mind that's bigger than what you have initially anticipated. You want a short transaction, and I've got something far bigger and more significant than your quick tur transaction turnaround. How many of you understand what I'm saying? So I think sometimes we do that with God. We want these like super like spot on the moment, instantaneous pop microwave popcorn. You know, you pour in your water and you get zip fizz and you got instant energy. Boom, just like that. But God seems to be more process oriented. And I would say this. I believe God does that because of who he's forming us to be. Because we're being shaped on the inside as long as we stay in the conversation. As long as we stay open to the dialogue, and I think I would say this as well, as long as we're honest, quit making it religious, family. <laughs> that doesn't help anything. It's deceptive, and I think the religious stuff doesn't get you anywhere. It's just smoke and mirrors. Put your cards on the table, and let's have some come together and reason with God. And say, dude, this is a struggle for me. And of course, I'm humble. Of course, I want to honor you. And of course, I want to be respectful. But at the same time, this is a real struggle for me. I'm having a hard time. This backfired. So that's what Moses does. And then again, in chapter 6, more conversation. Chapter 6, verses 10 through 13, back and forth some more. Because after Pharaoh tightens down the screws, Moses and the Israelites get super frustrated and they're like, hey, this is not what we signed up for. We wanted to be more free, and now it's even worse, worse uh, problems from Pharaoh. So Moses goes back. I love what Moses does. He goes back to God, and, and he reiterates some of those initial conversations. He says to God, look, the Israelites are upset with me. They're not listening to me. Pharaoh's not going to listen to me. And I can't even speak right. I'm unskilled in my speech. And I like that Moses puts the obstacles on the table with God. He's like, you know, I agreed. I signed up for this because of that burning bush thing. And we saw this progressive uh, confirmation. You, you showed me, yes, you're doing this. But now it's backfired. And it seems like we're back at square one. The Israelites are upset with me. They don't want to listen to me. Pharaoh's not listening to me. And I told you in the first place, I can't talk to save my life. So we're back at square one with this whole thing. And here we are again. That's, I love Moses' honesty. I love it. Because I think it, it gives us license, permission, a green light to be honest with God. And to say, look, I don't get it. And here I am, and I'm ready for you to talk to me. I'm ready to listen. I'm ready to have, have this dialogue. So he does with God. And then in chapter 6, verses 29 through chapter 7, verse 5. God initiates a conversation with Moses, and he says, and, he's, and he tells Moses, look, I know that Pharaoh's not going to listen to you. I know that you feel like you can't speak, but I'm going to liberate the Israelites. I'm going to do this. And, and appreciate that in this, these conversations, this is a lot of back and forth. You get the first two chapters, Exodus 3 and 4, back and forth. And then you get this integration into Moses' daily living. But I like that that integration also facilitates conversation. So Moses goes back with the conversation and starts to bring God into, this is my daily life. You told me to come to Pharaoh. I did what you told me to do. Now it's worse. And I like that Moses starts the con continues the conversation, not just on the backside of the desert, but now in the midst of doing what God said. I'm trying. I put my toe in the water, and it's not going well. 
I know God says to him, I've got your back, and it's going to turn out well. You're going to have some difficulties. There's going to be some hardships. Pharaoh's heart's going to be hard. I'm just telling you ahead of time, this is going to be difficult, but trust me, I've got your back. And yes, I'm, I'm going to bring you through. And yes, at the end of the day, God still wins. God is sovereign. He's on the throne. He's not chewing his nails thinking what's going to happen. God knows. God is God. And nobody replaces God. Nobody defies God. Nobody says enough and says, and it's over. God is God. And so what happens is, and I appreciate when I saw this, this really kind of struck a chord with me. From chapter 3 through the beginning of chapter 7, four chapters, there's that initial conversation. Then you have the validation, confirmation of it. But then Moses starts to bring this conversation into the daily obedience, the daily living. But once you hit chapter 7, verse 5, it's the plagues. And when I started looking at, at what happened in those plagues, here's how that rolled out. When God said to Moses, take water from the Nile, pour it on the ground, Moses did it. When God said, wave your rod and you're going to get frogs everywhere, Moses did it. When God said, uh, take ashes from the furnace, throw it in the air, it's going to turn into gnats, Moses did it. When God said to Moses, go tell everybody that there's going to come a big hailstorm, you need to t get your animals in for cover, Moses did it. Moses' obedience for those 10 plagues. I mean, and, and the whole, whole nation of Egypt, by the time you get to plague 7, 8, 9, the place is a complete desolate, I mean, it's a wasteland. I mean, the whole place has been obliterated, and there's nothing left. I mean, the, the grass is gone, the trees are gone, the cattle are dead, the, you know, all this. I mean, it is a disaster. You talk about a FEMA like protocol needing to zip in there. FEMA, you know, federal emergency, right, whatever that is. So this was beyond FEMA, <laughs> whatever. It was way beyond FEMA. But appreciate that Moses could be that obedient, be that steady, be that consistent, because he had this, this backlog, if you will, of conversations with God. And when you watch that obedience and how that plays out, Plague after plague after plague after plague. I, I love Moses, that Moses could step into that and do exactly what God said because he had ironed out the wrinkles, the frustrations, the challenges, the questions, the difficulties, the obstacles. He had ironed those out in those conversations. So when the rubber hit the road for this huge plague demonstration, that took over the course of 10 plagues, Moses was all in, both feet totally on board. And at the end of the day, you look at all the outcomes for Moses. Okay, 10 plagues. Then we got the Red Sea. Then we got Sinai. Then we got the Ten Commandments. Then we got the Golden Calf. And then we got the Tabernacle. And you got manna. You got all this stuff that's going on. But the, the backbone, the structure for it was laid, the groundwork for it was in those conversations. And so I want us to appreciate that the conversations we have with God are very significant, very important, and they lead, they make the runway for the future destiny that God has for us. We can't go down that runway without having some of these conversations. And some of us in the room, some of us need to talk through and resolve some of those challenges, those difficulties, those hardships, those frustrations, the questions. What happened back here? Why did this go on? Even tonight I was up here and I was talking with God. I was like, hey, you know, I wasn't real happy how this whole scenario turned out back here. In fact, this was not good. But I felt God say to me, yeah, and look it, because I, this turned out the, not necessarily in a good way, but what it did is it positioned you for more of your true identity, Sarah. Ooh. Well, that was a good conversation. And it facilitates runway for destiny with your identity, your divine identity. No, I didn't put Belle up to that. <laughs> that was her own gig. So I want to just point out a couple things, and then we're going to finish with the song, Do It Again. God will do it again. So I want to point out a couple things to remember 
in your conversations with God. Number one, whatever God asks you to do will be impossible <laughs> and require God's help. I said that earlier and just reemphasize it. Number two, God has a different timeline. Yeah, you got it, Rob? You're going to tell him things. God has a different timeline than the human perspective. God had a long, a long track record, or a long, long distance, had a long game in mind, and not just a quick transaction. So I don't know much about golf because it makes me fall asleep every time I watch it. <laughs> I've only played like putt putt golf, you know, and that's the short game. And I, those are nice because it's like just hit it. But I know that golf also has this idea of a long game. You have to have a long game, probably a middle game, somebody help me, and a short game. <laughs> You're like, woo. But God has all of the game. God has a long game as well as a short game. And so appreciate that a lot of times we want that quick, you know, solve, and God say, no, think of this in, in a long perspective and not just a short and then number three, value increments and in progress, not just achievement. A lot of times we have these ideas that if we're not achieving these big things or whatever, then it's insignificant, not important. If Moses had that mindset, then meeting up with Jethro would have been irrelevant. Then Aaron showing up on his doorstep, no big deal. Then the Israelites believe in the signs and wonders would have been not important to him. None of that would have had any impact because of just the big achievement. But I want you to appreciate that God designs us to celebrate progress, <laughs> to celebrate incremental stuff, in incremental, incremental little steps. Stop listening to the enemy accuse and condemn and berate you because you haven't, you haven't arrived. You haven't landed. That's the enemy telling you you're a loser. You're a fake. You're a failure. You're not big enough. You're not. That's the enemy accusing you. Stop letting that narrative run in your mind. And choose to celebrate progress and increments. And then last but not least. Integrate your conversations with God into your daily living. In the car. On the light rail. As you're grocery shopping. As you're studying. As whatever you're doing. Let's integrate those conversations. Hey, God, I'm really having a difficult time. Hey, God, that was really amazing what you just did back there. Woo, that was phenomenal. Just celebrate and begin integrating, keeping those conversations integrated into our daily life.